If you're our visitor today, we're really glad that you're here. And my name is Jeff. I'm one of the pastors, uh, and I'm, I'm thrilled that you are here. I want you to take your Bible and open it to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. We have been looking these last several weeks at what is often called the Sermon on the Plain, where Jesus has come down from a mountain and he's standing on a plain. Thousands of people have come to hear him teach. It's somewhat similar to a passage that Matthew records in his gospel in chapters 5, 6, and 7 that we know as the Sermon on the Mount. And even though they look a lot of like in some aspects, they're different. Uh, to begin with, the one in Matthew is a sermon not on the plain, but on the mount. It says Jesus went up into the mountain. It was a different time, a different group of people, different circumstances. But the principles that Jesus is teaching are basically the same ones. And that's why sometimes I've been referring to this as Jesus' core truth, truth that he teaches over and over. And so everything that Jesus is doing here is designed to let us know what it means to be his follower. Now, this Sermon on the Plain began back in verse 20 of Luke chapter 6. It is going to end in verse 49. Uh, we'll be looking at that last segment next week. But in the meanwhile, we have been seeing in this message of Jesus that everything that he says is countercultural. It goes right in the face of conventional wisdom and what most of us have always heard and thought and imagined and whatnot. Jesus takes that and turns it upside down. And basically, he has told us that as his followers, he wants us to be three things. He wants us to be lovers, he wants us to be doers, and he wants us to be givers. That's a, that's a pretty tall order because our natural tendency, and this is why I say it's countercultural, our natural tendency, uh, we like to lust, covet, curse, and take. I mean, that's just kind of the way that we are. And, and not exclusively, but when you come right down to the core of who we are, we wrestle with that. And Jesus is wanting three things for us, and this is the section that we're in now. He wants us to be people that can see life clearly. We talked about that last week. And today we're going to talk about the fact that Jesus wants us to live fruitful lives. And then next week we're going to see in these last verses, 46 to 49, that he wants us to build our lives on a solid foundation. Okay, sounds like pretty basic stuff, but as we get into it, we begin to see that Jesus takes what we thought we've always heard, and he twists it in such a unique way that it kind of turns things upside down. And what I want to do this morning is use this as kind of a segue into our discussion today about the very core of our nature and what kind of fruit that we bear in our lives. So let's look at the text. We're going to begin in verse 43, very short passage this morning. For a good tree brings not forth corrupt fruit, or rotten fruit. Neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth that which is good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Now, all the way through this sermon, we have seen Jesus use this series of contrast. And it's not just Jesus. We see this all the way through the Bible. You, you see two things contrasted, two types of people that are mentioned here using a tree as a metaphor. Two types of people, two worldviews. We saw that earlier in this message, two different worldviews. Uh, we have seen here that we should expect two types of fruit depending upon our nature. Next week, we're going to talk about two foundations in life. Did you notice there's never a third option? That's pretty significant. I want you to think about that. It's never like, okay, there's the good, and then there's the bad, and then there's the kind of good are kind of bad, depending on whether you're a half full or half empty glass type person. There's never that option. 
When it comes to being a follower of Jesus, the way that Jesus talks about it is either you are or you aren't. Either you're a good person or you're not. Wow. That, that kind of comes in the face of some of the things that we like to talk about. And here there are more contrasts. If you look at this passage we just read, verses 43 to 45, he uses the word good five times. He uses the words corrupt or evil five times. And so again, you see this pairing, this contrast, one or the other. And the reason that he's talking about this, and this is so important to get, the, the essence of his message here is life and how we live it is a matter of nature. What is your true nature? And using this illustration of a tree and the type of fruit that it bears, he's going to expound on that. And, and first of all, we have to talk about just basic human nature in general. And I, I talk about this being a countercultural message, and the reason for that is because we, we have a myth that, that all human beings are basically good, but sometimes we mess up and we need a little help. And Jesus says, no, either you have a bad nature or you have a good nature. And you do according to the fruit of your nature. You say, wow, that's tough. Tough. Have you been following along with what we've seen here since verse 20, where, where Jesus said, love your enemies? Where he's told us that we're to be forgiving people and all this time. Talk about tough. That, that's the point. It's more than tough. It is against our nature. We've got a flawed nature. And it is impossible for us on our own efforts, our own power, to live the way that Jesus says we're supposed to live. That's the point. And what Jesus is getting at is that we need a new nature. We don't need a self-improvement course. We don't need to try harder. We don't need to dig down and deeper and get it out of us because he said that's, that's the problem. It's a matter of nature. Good trees bring good fruit. Bad trees bring bad fruit. What we need is a change of nature. Does that mean that there is no good, no remnants of God's nature in those who are not believers? No. Even bad people can sometimes do good things. It's a matter of our nature and a root of corruption in us that is constantly spreading. The, the Bible calls that root of corruption sin, okay, just so that we can understand very clearly what we're talking about here. It's a matter of nature. You ever come across a rotten egg? We talk about them all the time. Very few people have probably ever seen one, but if you have, it's, it's a memorable occasion. It, it looks okay on the outside, you break it open, and it's rotten on the inside. So what do you do if you have a rotten egg? Do you, do you put it on the cutting board and you try to separate the good part from the bad part? If you do, don't invite me to your house to eat. Please don't do that. I value my life. Uh, of course you don't. I mean, it looks okay on the outside, but on the inside there is something rotten, and whether it's 100% rotten or 90% rotten or 20% rotten is not the issue. It's rotten. And it's all rotten before everything is said and done. It's kind of like stage four cancer that has begun to metastasize throughout the entire body. It's one of those situations where you realize, wow, you know, we, we can do some things to make you comfortable and, and we can do this and we can do that, but w without a miraculous intervention of God, this doesn't look good at all. It's a matter of nature. And if living like this like Jesus is telling us since verse 20. And, and that's what this is all about. Hey, you want to be my follower? Okay, here's what I expect of you. Really? Love my enemies? Really? Live life for you and not for me? Even though it might cost me something, even though it might become unpleasant, even though I might have opposition and persecution, even though sometimes I might go hungry, live, live my life for you and not for me? And, and what's going on here is that if this were possible, just by coming to church every now and then, getting a little pep talk, kind of getting encouraged, you can do it, go out and do it, and try harder and be gooder. 
If, if that were really possible, then here's, here's the problem with that. Jesus would not have needed to die upon the cross. What he did in his death, burial, and resurrection would be meaningless. If we on our own, just by working harder and doing more, being more sincere and all that type of stuff, if, if that were possible, then Jesus would not have needed to have done what he did. But he did because it's not a matter of how hard we try or how much we do or what degree of sin we have or don't have. It's a matter of nature. We need a new one. And so the contrast here, using this tree metaphor, is a contrast between our natural human nature and the transformed nature that Jesus offers his followers who have put their faith in him and follow him. Transformation from being a bad tree to being a good tree is only possible in the power of God. So all these values that we've been looking at here in the Sermon on the Plain is more than just a discussion of values. It's the need for transformation. And that's what I'm telling you this morning. What you need is, is not to go to church more. I, I think you ought to go to church, okay? I mean, the, the Bible talks about we're, we're the assembly of God. We assemble. That's what we do. It's part of it. But we don't do that to get something. We do that because we are something. And so I'm just here to say that what we all need is a transformed nature. Now, there's some cultural drama that is going on beneath the surface of these events because as we've been pointing out as we've gone along through the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is constantly attracting people on the margin of society. Like Levi, the tax collector. Pretty universally despised and hated, mistrusted, and he becomes a follower of Jesus. Jesus actually reached out to him, you remember that? And we see Jesus reaching out to people who were not even Jews. That was unheard of at that time. We see Jesus elevating women to a position of respect and equality. That was sure not the norm, even today in many places. And, and so you see this attitude that Jesus has of, of attracting people that you would not think of as being good people. When it came time to choose his apostles, he did not reach out and choose those who were theologically educated and had all these decades of religious service and, uh, service and, and experience and whatnot. He called a group of 20-something guys, none of whom had theological training, and he said, you're going to be my official representatives. And as you might imagine, this was pretty hard for the religious established leadership to accept. Not only did it make them uncomfortable, it made them extremely angry to the degree that even here in the Gospel of Luke to this point, we have, we have seen them talk about, okay, we have to get rid of him. How do we get rid of Jesus? Because he is a threat. He is a danger. Now, there's a lesson here. Socially and religiously accepted folks like the scribes and Pharisees who are trusting in what they believe to be their inherent goodness and the religious service for their salvation are being left behind by Jesus. Because good, God-fearing, church-going people, as we would say today, need this transformation just as much as anyone. Now, please let that sink in for just a moment. This is so important. I, I just want you to understand, being a follower of Jesus is not a matter of the name that may be on the front of a building where people assemble on Sunday mornings. It's a matter of being a follower of Jesus Christ and living by the teaching of Scripture, whatever the name of the organization may be or whatever, whatever, denomination, all that type of stuff. And I believe, after years of observation, and I'm, I'm certainly not alone in this, that every church that calls itself a Christian church in this world probably has people in it who are trusting in their inherent goodness instead of the grace of God to their 
eternal peril. Well, Jeff, you believe there's people like that right here? Yeah, I do. I believe some of them are sitting here listening to me right now. And you're trusting in the fact that you're a good, God-fearing, church-going person. You give to the church, you say good things, you do good things, and uh, that's why you're good to go. And I'm just simply saying Jesus is pulling the rug out from underneath you here. They say, no, you've either got a good nature or you're, you've got a bad nature, not because of what you do. It's not because of the things that fill up your life. It's because of the essence of our nature. And it's not a matter of the degree of goodness or the degree of evil. Anybody ever find any place in the Bible where it says, okay, if you're up to 70% on the goodness level, you're, you're okay? Or if you're, you're above 65% in evil, man, you're, you're, you're hopeless. No, it's good, bad. Lost, saved. Follow Jesus, don't follow Jesus. Because it's not a matter of what we do. It's not a matter of what we say. It's not a matter of how much we have. Yeah, he wants us to be lovers and givers and doers. Yeah, that, that's, that's correct. But we are because he has made us to be something new. We don't do those things to get something, but because we are something. I hope that's making sense. I hope you're, you're hearing what I'm saying because you need a transformed nature. You got to have it. You say, wow, never thought of it that way. I'd like to talk to somebody about it. I'm glad you mentioned that. There's a little contact card in the back of the seats around you. And if at any time, today, any other time, God begins to speak to you. And you say, this is too important. I need to talk to somebody and find out for sure. If you would take that card, fill out the contact information, circle the C down in the little ABC line there so that we know you want somebody to contact you. And whether you're wanting to make sure that you have eternal life in this transformed nature or whether you're somebody that says, well, I, I knew that I was on this road years ago and I, I seem to have gotten lost along the way. What do I do? How do I, how do I get back? Then turn that into the VIG counter right outside these doors when you leave today, and we'll get in touch with you as soon as we possibly can. It happens all the time. You're not alone. Okay? It doesn't mean you're weird. It doesn't mean that you're an evil person. It just, this is too important. It's a matter of nature. So Jesus is talking here in this passage, verse 43, about a good tree and a corrupt tree. Good trees bring forth good fruit. Corrupt trees bring forth corrupt fruit. A good man, verse 45, out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil. So what, what's, what, what is good? What, what is this, who is this good man here? You know, it's very similar to a discussion that Jesus had. And Dr. Luke records it right here in the same gospel. Look in Luke chapter 18 and verse 18. This is a wealthy, influential young man who comes to Jesus. In verse 18, a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Great question. Now, he's wanting to do something. So tell me what I have to do. And notice how Jesus answered him. Jesus does this a lot. He answers a question with a question. And he says unto him, Why do you call me good? None is good except or save one that is God. Now there's the question. The issue is not what do you have to do. The issue is who am I? You just called me good master. Do you really mean that? Do you really understand what you just said? There is only one who is good, and that is God. Now, you called me good master. Do you really mean that? It goes right over his head. Jesus says in verse 20, you know the commandments. Don't commit adultery, don't kill, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor your father and mother. He said, oh, all these have I kept from my youth up. He's still focused on what does he have to do. And when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, 
Now, he's not giving him a plan of salvation here, okay? Don't think that this is normative for everyone. He's pushing the guy's hot button. Okay, you're, you're focused on what you've done and what more you need to do, okay? How about this? Why don't you, you, you just lack one thing. Go and sell everything you have, distribute it unto the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. Bingo. Now, is Jesus saying that all you got to do to get to heaven is sell everything you have and give it to the poor? No, that's not what he's saying. Jesus had already made the main point, who am I? But he doesn't get it because he's focused on what do I have to do? And so Jesus is simply exposing him for what he really is. He was maybe an 80 percenter of good. But he had some issues. He needed to be 100% good in nature. And there's only one way to get good in nature if the only good is God, and that is to become a God person, or what the Bible calls a godly person, a reflection of God himself, because by the grace of God, that person's nature has been transformed and his spirit now lives in us. Does that mean we can never mess up? Of course not. But it means that inside of us, is the basic goodness of God. That's the issue. That's what we saw in verse 40. Look back in verse 40 last week. The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect, mature, adult is what that means, shall be as his master. So what's, what's the essence of being a disciple of Jesus? Becoming like him. Becoming like him. Not a matter of doing, it's a matter of being and becoming like him. How does that happen? You put your faith in him. His grace transforms you, makes you into something new. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, new creation. Old things are passed away, all things are become new. It's a new nature. It's not like, okay, if you go to church three out of four Sundays for a year, then you'll go to heaven. No, not at all. Well, if you tie, then you'll really get to heaven. And, and if you join a small group, that'll help too. And if you show up for second Saturday to help clean the ball fields, you'll really get there fast. <laughs> Probably pass over and die of a heart attack, go directly to heaven. But <laughs> that's another discussion. The only way to be a good person is to be a godly person. You say, well, what does that look like and how do I know? And Jesus gives us the answer. Check the fruit. Good trees give good fruit. Bad trees give bad fruit. Wow, what an interesting thought. <laughs> but the figure of the tree is nothing new to the people who are listening to Jesus. This is an agriculturally based society. And this is a figure that is used all the way through the Bible. And so when Jesus talks about this, this is this is not an aha moment for them. This is like, oh, yeah. Let me, give you an, let me give you some examples. Look in Psalm 92, the 92nd Psalm and verse 12, which says, The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing, those who are at least 73% righteous. <laughs> you see what's wrong with our conventional wisdom? Well, I'm mostly good. No, it's a matter of nature. It's a matter of nature. And, and then if you'll, you'll look in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 4, Isaiah is using an illustration of a vineyard full of vine trees to describe God's working with the nation of Israel. And in verse 4, he concludes, what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done to it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, it brought forth wild grapes, bad fruit. Why? Bad vine trees. 
And God says, what more could I have done? I did everything. Right there, ladies and gentlemen, there's the Old Testament. God chose out of people. He did everything. He gave them his truth. He gave them leaders. He gave them the, the law. He gave them everything. What more could I have done? And when it came time for there to be fruit, there was bad fruit. Why? Bad tree. That is a parable for all of us. Does it mean that they were all bad? No, it's not an issue of how bad and how good. It's a matter of good or bad nature. It's a matter of nature. It's a matter of essence. The egg is rotten or it is not. That's why when John the Baptist came along, we saw this earlier in Luke, Luke chapter 3, and he says in verse 9 of Luke 3, and now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees, and every tree which brings forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Again, that was nothing new. He's using the same imagery that the prophets of Israel have used for centuries. In James chapter 3 and verse 12, James also uses the same figure in verse 12 when he says, Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh it's a matter of nature it's not a matter of trying harder and doing more it's a matter of nature in that sermon on the mount that matthew records in matthew chapter 7 jesus picks up again on this same theme it's so common matthew chapter 7 look in verse 16 you shall know them by their fruits Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, I was baptized in Graceway. I tithe. I showed up for second Saturday. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. It's a matter of nature. It's a matter of nature. Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. I mean, it's just, guys, it goes on. Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. Jesus again is speaking. And he says, uh, either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. So this is not an isolated theme. This is not something that Jesus is just standing around one day on this plane. He's got these thousands of people, and he's thinking, okay, i got another 20 minutes to go. What do I say? So he, he picks this figure out of the air. I know. I'll talk about trees. No, this is, this is not isolated. Good fruit does not come from bad trees and vice versa. Now, that's what verses 44 and 45 are about back in Luke chapter 6. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns do men not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of his heart his mouth speaks. So even if you're a city dweller, that would be me, I am an urban guy. I want to make that clear. I have never been a farm boy. I have never been a person of the earth for even a day in my life, not even in my wildest imagination or dreams. I would not know what to do. I can't grow grass, much less crops. (laughs) I just cut it when I can because I don't know what to do with it. But even I know that if I want oranges, I don't just go and duct tape them onto a pine tree. (laughs) I get that. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying it's a matter of nature. Orange trees have oranges. 
and fig trees have figs, okay? You don't harvest grapes from bramble bushes. It's just a matter of nature. This is the boundary between those who follow Jesus and those who don't. Do you see what's happening? All of this, this is not an isolated passage. All of this is part of the same sermon that Jesus is preaching on the plain that day. He's got these thousands of people that have come and they're interested. Some of them are committed to following him. Some of them are curious. Some of them are tire kickers. Some of them are just, they've never heard anybody talk like this. They're going to come out and see what the big deal is about. And so Jesus is saying, look, if you want to follow me, here's what it's about. Here's what I expect of you. But you need to understand something. It's not a matter of degrees of good or bad. It's a matter of nature. You need a new nature. When you put your faith in me, only God can make you good. Only God can give you a new nature. And so this becomes the boundary between those who are just in the crowd listening and those who are true followers of Jesus Christ. It's the same boundary that divides this room this morning. You say, well, how do I know? Check the fruit. Check the fruit. People who follow Jesus grow to become like him, and they reproduce themselves. What do trees do? They reproduce. Orange trees give oranges, and apple trees have apples, and followers of Jesus bring forth other followers of Jesus. That's what we do. And if it's not there, I would be terrified. It's just too important to take a chance. Now, that does not mean that those who follow Jesus will always, without fail, do good. Those of you who are thinking very literally and very legalistically, you go, oh, well, that means if I ever ever committed a sin that I can't be a follower of Jesus because it's all, no, 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 no. Listen to what he's saying. And look in verse 45. He says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart. What is a treasure? It's, it's something ab- abundant. And that's why he says, for of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. And that's the issue. What is the essence of your nature? Can a good apple tree have a couple of rotten apples? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it happens. But if it's a good tree, it's got a lot of good apples. <laughs> That's the abundance. That's the treasure. You can have an apple tree that's dying and decaying and still have a couple of good apples, but yet the preponderance of fruit is either going to be non-existent or it's going to be bad. It's a matter of the essence of the nature. And that's why Jesus said, whatever, whatever is your nature, out of that nature comes the fruit. Does it mean you can never do any dumb things or never sin? Of course not. That's not the point. The point is, what is your basic nature? And the only way for a flawed human being with a sin nature, a rotten nature, a decayed nature, in spite of all the good things that people can do, and they do, we need a transformation. We don't need a course in self-improvement. We need to be transformed. And the whole point is that good people out of a good heart speak good and do good. How do we evaluate our speech? What does our speech have to say about us? doesn't mean you can never have a bad day or a bad period. Sometimes you run into a wall, you get hurt, you're you're in a state of shock, and you, you might do and say some stupid things. But out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. And the abundance of our heart, that nature, is always going to prevail. And there is a predictability based on the nature of the heart. That's the issue. So, I I guess the question that we need to consider, how's your fruit? Are you growing to be more like Jesus? Say, oh man, I've I've been a member of this church for 30 years. Super. I'm serious. That's great. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. But if your life is no different now 
than it was 30 years ago. And you've never seen your life reproduced in the lives of others. Be worried. Be concerned. I'm not talking about any program. I'm not talking about five simple steps. I'm just saying people reproduce themselves. It's what we do. And when we are transformed by the grace of God and we are growing to be more like Jesus, and what happens is we see people around us who begin to be transformed into his image as well. And sometimes we may use a formal program or a system or a study or a, or a book or a guide or whatever it may be, and sometimes we may it, it just good people are going to reproduce themselves. And bad people do too. So what does that look like for you? Where's the fruit? Have you been transformed? Is there evidence? Is there proof? And, and let me mention that there are people who have sincerely put their faith in Jesus Christ at some point in life, and something happens, and they get sidetracked. They lose their way. I didn't say they lose their salvation. They lose their way. They, 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 they get confused. And then pretty soon they're, they're back living like a corrupt person lives instead of the person that God has made them to be. It happens. It's sad. It shouldn't. It does. And so maybe you're analyzing yourself and you're going, I think that's me. Whether you have ever been transformed before or whether you were and you're just long a long way from where you need to be you need to make sure that you are a good tree and good trees bring forth good fruit we can really get messed up know that I can get messed up sometimes I do get messed up we all get messed up we all have bad periods bad days we all do stupid things we all sometimes sin I don't know about you, but in my case, I was 18 years old when I put my faith in Jesus Christ, and he made me something else. I don't know how, how else to describe it. He made me something else. And it was excruciating at times. Sometimes it was wonderful. Sometimes it hurt. <laughs> But I look back on my life, I go, no, he made me something totally different than what I was. And there have been times in life where I've, I've strayed from how he wants me to, and you know what he does? He always brings me back. Hebrews talks about that, by the way. Talks about that loving discipline of God, like a loving father or mother that goes after those kids that are headed down the wrong way. Says, hey, 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 no, 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 back, back. So what do you do with your kids if they uh, insist on being stupid? I hope you still love them. And I hope you keep the door open and the light on. And you still love them. Well, how long should I do that? I don't think you get it. <laughs> That's the way that, that God treats us. When he has made us anew, he is anxiously waiting for us to come back to him and to live in accordance with the abundance of goodness that he has put in us. It's kind of like uh, trees can get diseases, right? And at some point, the analogy breaks down. We, we all understand that. But growing is a progression. We learn what it means to put our faith in Jesus Christ and become more like him. We naturally begin this journey by following him in baptism and proclaiming to the world, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm not ashamed of him. And, and we continue this growth process just like he identified with us in his baptism. And then we grow we grow like a tree. Psalm 1 says that uh, when we meditate day and night in the scriptures, we become like a tree planted by rivers of living water. 
and we bring forth our fruit in its season. The trees bring forth fruit every day. Very rarely, they bring forth fruit in a season. And so we bring forth fruit in our season. And he goes on to say, and everything that he does will prosper. We'll have good success. Wow. That's the life that Jesus wants for every one of us. The question is, do you want it? I can't answer that question. Not for you. I can answer it for me. What steps do we need to take in life in order for that to become a reality? I can't answer that question for you either. Make sure that you've been transformed. Make sure you know what it is to grow. Make sure that you're learning the scriptures. There's so many opportunities for that around here, much more than what happens on Sunday morning. I want us to stand. Let's commit ourselves to God in prayer.